Hey, this is Charlie Thompson, and these are the lecture slides for week two of development. And I put a link in the in the start of the lecture slides to a Wikipedia article on colonialism, specifically colonialism and geography, referring to the role of geographers and the role that geography played in facilitating colonialism. So development process of improving the material conditions of people through the diffusion of knowledge and technology. That sounds like a good goal. Let's see how that's playing out across the world. Uh, the big questions we're going to tackle this week, why does development vary among countries? Where are the more and less developed countries? At this point, you should have a really good idea about the more and less developed countries in terms of just regions of the world. Where does the level of development vary by gender? I think the answer to that is everywhere. Why do less, why do less developed countries face obstacles to development? Well, because it's not in the economic best interests of the more developed countries to let the less developed countries develop. What problems are associated with development? Yeah, we'll, we'll look at some of the it's not really the problems associated with development itself, but the problems associated with trying to increase development. And I got to start with the Industrial Revolution. I don't think we can really talk about development and really understand the historic roots of development and the present day patterns without going back and looking at the early advantages as a result of industrialization, which is why it was one of the, uh, the th it was the second of the three revolutions that transformed population on earth. So industrialization, where and when, what did it lead up to? What were the effects after? Industrialization began in England around 1750. James Watt developed the steam engine, which removed the spatial and temporal limits of work. Uh, this was revolutionary, absolutely revolutionary. Prior to the development of the steam engine, you relied on animals or wind or water for power. So you were there were limits spatially. The wind doesn't always blow. Uh, spatial, or yeah, the wind doesn't always blow everywhere, right? I guess that should have been temporal. Temporal time, spatial space. Like, it's not windy every place. It's not windy all the time. There aren't streams every place. Uh, the, other, the other sources of power were animals, either humans or other animals, and even those have limits. Wind, water, animals, the sources of power prior to the development of the steam engine. And with the steam engine, you could have power any place you wanted. So prior to part of industrialization was the movement in England called the enclosure movement. There used to be common lands in villages, in towns. There would be areas that would be set aside for everyone to use equally. So if you were a peasant, you could probably raise some animals there. Uh, and the enclosure movement was when the rich people said, no, 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 this is ours. You poors don't get to use it anymore. Uh, and so this common good was privatized, made into a private good. And the result was uh, economic, economic, economic problems for the peasants, for the poorer people in England. So they converted public land to private land. Marx argued this represented a shift from subsistence-based feudalism to capitalism. I think Marx is absolutely right. Uh, one of the main tenets of Marxism is that workers need to control the means of production. And exactly at this point, the control of the means of production lay in the hands of the wealthy. So in this case, means of production is referring to this land that would allow you to produce animals. Uh, could refer to a factory, the means of production. So when the rich people had all the land and all the factories, the poor people were really at a disadvantage. And in fact, it's at this time, as this was happening, that Marx was writing his early works, uh, beginning to put together his theories that we now call Marxism as the result of industrialization and the development of capitalism in England in the, uh, the 1800s. 
So it truly was a revolution, massive economic and social shift from self-directed village life to controlled city life. If you were a shepherd, nobody tells you when to wake up or go to sleep. You're just out there all the time taking care of your animals. If you're a farmer, farmers pretty much work worldwide from sunup till sundown. Uh, if you're retired, you could stop. If you were hungry, you could go get food. If you had to go to the bathroom, you'd go to the bathroom. So once we had a shift from self-directed village life, when you're, uh, and maybe you're at home, maybe you're a small scale producer of clothing, that you're making clothing that people would come and buy. Well, now you're in a factory and the factory can't stop for one person. The factory needs to go. Massive gains in efficiency as the result of factories, as the result of industrialization. Uh, agricultural, massive, massive, massive gains shifting from horses and oxen to tractors later on, for example, allowed one person to farm much, much, much more land. So there were some really good parts. There were some really absolutely horrible parts. Yeah, textiles by machine, 500 times faster. One of the big things that happened was the feedback loops that once they started, once the Industrial Revolution started, it, it allowed for improvements in chemistry, in metalworking that, that created, led to uh, better quality metal, which led to machining, actually making things with machines and the idea, and this is radical, I keep saying it's a revolution, interchangeable parts at one point was a radical new idea. Uh, interchangeable parts are something that we take for granted. If something breaks inside a machine, you, I think we just assume you can go to the manufacturer and buy a replacement part and that replacement part is going to be identical and it'll fit. Well, back in the day, going to this idea of self-directed village life, Things were made one at a time, like a gun, for example. The parts of that gun would be individually handmade and would work in that gun, in that rifle, let's just say. Uh, and so there weren't interchangeable parts until much later when we had these advances as the result of industrialization. So the Industrial Revolution was concentrated in a few industries. We saw textiles that first used water to drive these mills, and then steam power with watt. Uh, iron making, again, advancements in metallurgy. So the metals were becoming stronger, were becoming more consistent. Machine tools, once we have better metals, uh, once we have more consistent metals, we can begin using machines to make other machines, and then the machines and the parts that are made are going to be identical. Mechanized spinning and weaving locomotives. So for the first time now, we have mechanized transport. And again, those spatial and temporal limits that we saw uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution. For example, if you were a ship, right, you'd be a sailing ship. There, there wasn't any other option. You could be as, well, you know, it could be a canoe or a rowboat. But if you're going across the ocean and carrying a lot of cargo you would need to be a steamship. Well, with the advent of the steam engine, you could sail any direction, any time of year. You didn't have to wait for the trade winds to shift, for example. Uh, locomotives, same thing. If it, Yeah, uh, because the power was created by steam and transmitted through steel, this again has incredible effects. Uh, if you think of the drive shaft that's taking power from an engine and sending it to the wheels of a truck, for example, if that drive shaft had to be made out of wood, you wouldn't be able to transmit nearly as much power as you could out of steel. Same thing with buildings. Uh, we see skyscrapers once we get uh, higher quality metal and we can create steel skyscrapers. Uh, there's a reason that we don't have timber buildings or buildings made out of wood that are as tall as the Empire State Building, and that's just the, uh, the physical properties of the materials. So we see a shift from, from the natural world with wind and currents and water and wood to the human-made world with metal. Locomotives, steamboats, and steamships, again, the idea that now you can travel any direction, any time of year. Improvements in iron smelting. The electrical telegraph. So one of the ideas back from the very early days, reaching all the way back to the first chapter 
Um, the idea that we lived in a three mile an hour world until relatively recently. If you wanted to go any place that was a long distance, your top speed or your average speed over that distance was going to be about walking speed, about three miles an hour. Uh, so this led to things like the the Battle of New Orleans against the British in the War of 1812, that the Battle of New Orleans happened two weeks after the peace treaty was signed because there was no way to get news to people that quickly. And in fact, it was a month after the battle that they received news that the war had in fact ended. Well, the electrical telegraph now sends messages at the speed of light, literally. So one of the big ideas of human geography is that uh, changes, advancements in technology to communication and transportation have massive spatial implications. So now we see changes in technology. We have locomotives, we have steamboats, we have iron smelting and steel, and we have changes in communication technology. Instead of having to give a letter to a human, and then they would physically hand carry that letter to its destination, now you can transmit around the world uh, at the speed of light. Uh, our, our modern economic system depends on lightning fast communication. I want to ask you to think about, um, trading, doing business back in the 1800s prior to the telegraph, if you had to wait a month to get news. So if you're trying to set the prices for the upcoming season based on tea that you're importing from China, you'd send a letter to China that would take a month and then it would take a month for the letter to come back to you. So there's a two-month time delay for communications. Well, with the electrical telegraph, that's done away with. Everything is instant now. This led to further increases, follow-on increases to take advantage of the previous increases. Again, that positive feedback loop. Uh, iron making becomes steel making. We have mass production of machine parts, assembly lines, electrical grid systems, large-scale manufacture of machine tools, advanced machinery and steam-powered factories. So there was the first wave, and now we're seeing a second wave of industrialization. Large-scale production of chemicals. Uh, again, the scale of everything went from a handmade individual scale to massive, massive industrial scale. Cement, making roads, building all kinds of things easier to do. Gaslighting, and when I say gaslighting, I actually mean artificial light, that this was an incredibly important event. The number of days that we worked jumped dramatically with artificial lighting. Prior to artificial lighting and gas, and then later electric lighting, when it got dark, people just kind of went to sleep for the most part. Uh, in fact, in the American colonies, there were, there were two stages of sleep, and it was totally normal for people to, you know, it gets dark, sun goes down, they go to sleep, and then they'd wake up in the middle of the night and, like, go visit their neighbors for a couple hours and then go back home and go to sleep. But that was normal. Things change. Glass making, paper making, all these things that we take for granted are a result of the Industrial Revolution. Massive changes in agriculture with tractors, with plows, the shift from animal power to steam power, and then later diesel and gasoline power. Mining, transportation, canals and waterways linking cities, uh, facilitating import and export of goods. Canals and waterways happened across the United States just before the railroad. I, I look at them, I look at the people that were financing canals because they are often private projects. The people that finance the canals, I look at them as the people that were developing dial-up modems just before fiber and cable modems became popular. I mean, it was great for the time, but very, very shortly, it was completely obsolete. Like, why would you want a canal if you could have a railroad or a road? Roads Railways, 1800s, factories, all these things happened as the result of the second wave of the Industrial Revolution. Mass-produced goods. Yeah, like clothing and household articles back before the Industrial Revolution would have all, made, all been made by hand. You would know the people that make your clothes. You would know the people that made your shoes. You know, your shoes would probably have been based on your feet. Well, not anymore. In fact, uh, during the Civil War, American Army 
boots were, they weren't even left and right. They, they were just like the one, you got the one boot, well, you get two of them, but they'd be the same. And eventually they'd mold to your feet and become more comfortable. But really a huge change with mass produced goods of clothing and household articles. Everything in your house is now made in a factory instead of being made by your neighbor or made by yourself. And all of this then leads to, at the same time, part of this, we saw the enclosure movement. We saw the economic shift from the countryside to cities because of factories. And so we have this new wave of urbanization uh, happening across Europe and then later across the United States. Industrialization then set the stage for efficient colonization. I'm going to back up because I don't think this will make sense yet. So colonization is the idea that you would take over a country and you would set up conditions because you now control that other country that you are going to set up trade conditions where they're exporting raw materials for them are going to be dirt cheap. So you're going to get the raw materials from a country, massive amounts of raw materials, uh, cotton to be made into fabric or uh, metal or ore to be made into metals, and then you're producing goods that you sell back to the colonized people for a huge profit. So you take their raw materials and maybe you don't even pay because you're now running the show. So you are stealing their raw materials and then selling finished goods back to them at a huge profit. Okay, so economically, I think that makes sense. In terms of the human cost, it's it's incalculable. But economically, it makes sense now if you can get lots of raw materials. But the only reason that you would need lots of raw materials is after you have factories and you're mass producing goods like textiles and clothing and household articles. Before you can do that at scale, there's no reason to steal massive amounts of raw materials from other countries. So once we have factories that can accommodate, can make use of massive amount of raw materials. What we see next is colonization, the invasion and taking over of countries all over the world, mainly by Western powers. So here we have 1800, the stage of colonization as of 1800. Yellow is Spain. Uh, the United States is pink, oddly enough. England is blue. Russia uh, so by, by 1800, it looks like most of the Americans have been completely colonized. However, Africa, up until the Berlin Conference, and I put a link down here to the Berlin Conference, uh, I, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit, I knew that the Europeans divided up the countries in Africa, but they actually did it in 1884 at the Berlin Conference. <laughs> the Europeans all agreed so here we have European colonies in 1914. You can see Africa is now completely colonized by the French in blue and the British in this salmon color and the Portuguese in this blue. Who else? We have the Belgians in the Congo. Pre pretty much the main players. Uh, and then I guess the Spanish in uh, Western Sahara. I included in the slides a GIF, an animated GIF of colonization. So we're up to the 1500s, 1600s. Yeah, Russia, I never really thought of the fact that Russia internally colonized its own, <laughs> took over land that we think of as Russia, but there were people living there the whole time that, were, that did not think of themselves as Russians. 1882, 1885... 1914. So after the 1884 conference in, uh, yeah, in Berlin, the Berlin conference, 1938, 1959, we start to see the change in colonization with countries in Africa getting their independence, mainly from Britain. And by 2007, that's where we're at. So a, a good compare and contrast of some of the the colonization that had happened by 1880 as opposed to the colonization that had happened by 1913. And I found this a map showing all of the British possessions at the time, all of their colonies, that the, the phrase was, the sun never sets on the British Empire. And I think looking at all, all the little British flags all over the world, you see what they mean, that at, 
the sun is always shining on some place that the British had stolen. And that, that uh, continues today. Many of these overseas territories administered by the French uh, are still the result of colonization. They still don't have their independence, like the Falkland Islands that should be part of Argentina, but the British control it. How do we measure development? I'm going to use the UN's standards that they look at three areas, standard of living, knowledge, and long and healthy life. The Human Development Index, there it is. So we've got a decent standard of living. We're going to look at gross national income per capita in purchasing power parity, long and healthy life, life expectancy, and some of the other factors that go into that. And then knowledge. Surprise, the third goal after decent standard of living, long and healthy life is knowledge with mean years of schooling, expected years of schooling to create an education index. So we've got economic we've got uh, health, and we've got knowledge. All of those are the UN's Human Development Index. So we've got gross domestic product or gross national income. That, was, that represents all the money generated in a country per year. And PPP is purchasing power parity. If you make, uh, let's just say, $50,000 a year in the United States, that would be very different than making $50,000 a year in Monaco or $50,000 a year in Guatemala. So the PPP adjusts the income to the standard of living of that country. So if it's a more expensive country, those numbers get adjusted down. If it's a less expensive country, those numbers get adjusted up. So that you're really comparing the same numbers to the same numbers. So we've got the gross national income. These factors create the gross domestic product. Uh, economic structure contributes to gross national income. What kinds of activities, economic activities people are doing. We talked about this last week. I want to talk about it more this week. Worker productivity plays a role in gross national income. Worker productivity is the value added by workers' labor. Marx would be very happy with that idea uh, that the workers are actually the ones that are creating the value in the finished product with their labor. Social, we're going to measure standard of living with social and then long and healthy life. So looking at knowledge, we're looking at education and literacy, years of schooling, and then long and healthy life, we're looking at life expectancy. And some of the other factors that would be important in long and healthy life would be infant mortality rate, natural increase rate, crude birth rate, you know, those demographic factors that we talked about in the chapter on population. So put those things together and you have the Human Development Index. I think a perfect score would be 1.0. The best, the best would be 1.0 and the worst would be zero. So it's the same pattern, and I think it really reflects the, the patterns that we saw looking at, at population growth and population change, that much of Central Africa um, and parts of Asia are less developed, relatively speaking, to, for example, North America, Western Europe, and then Oceania, and South America to a lesser extent. This is the Human Development Index adjusted for economic inequality. And so it looks like the U.S. is doing worse. It looks like maybe, yeah, Spain and Portugal. Oh, and Italy too. That's interesting. And some places just don't have data. So if you take into account the economic inequality within a country, the HDI shifts slightly from our world and data, the Human Development Index in 2017. Same pattern, uh, North America, Western Europe, Oceania is more developed, a South Asia and Africa less developed. Uh, looking at scale, so scale is the, the size of what you're looking at. We've, we have one idea looking at, at uh, Brazil, looks like there may be 0 0.7, 0 0.8 on the good old HDI. But then within, within Brazil, there are less and more developed regions. So this would be inequality within countries. Looking at Brazil, we could look at uh, Turkey as well. 
In this case, we're just looking at GDP per capita with some areas, in fact, the larger cities, the regions with the larger cities, which would make sense based on what we talked about last week with in the cities, people are going to be making more money in, for example, the areas under Kurdish dominance and some of these areas, I would guess that they are doing more of their economy is in the primary extractive sector. They're probably a lot higher level of agricultural activity in these regions with the lower GDP. And then within regions, again, same, there's variability within regions. So North America, the US and Canada, they're both highly developed. Sub-Saharan Africa, there's some variation. South Africa, Botswana, a little bit more developed than the rest of South Africa of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Southwest Asia, there's more variation. Europe, there's some variation between like former Yugoslavian states or the former Soviet states. And Central Asia, medium. But again, you're also going to have those patterns with like the stands, uh, Tajikistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, we're going to have probably lower development. Although I suppose this whole region looking at Iran would be higher developed. Afghanistan as a result of nonstop conflict since, I was going to say since 1979, but that's just when the Russians invaded. They were just the last in a series or the most recent in a series of countries invading Afghanistan. Some good news. Uh, this is one of those rare times. Gosh, uh, all regions have increased their human development scores from 1980 to 2010. So over the last 30 years, uh, there's been some real gains made across the world. Looks like Southwestern Asia, North Africa is have has had a higher rate. East Asia also a higher rate of improvement than, for example, North America. I mean, we were already already very developed, so it's not surprising that we haven't developed. And And then I also want to point out that when we're talking about development, there is no like one thing you can look at and say, well, that you know this country is more developed because of their GDP. It, it doesn't work like that. It's, it's all of those things together. So what we're actually seeing then is an improvement in people's lives in Asia, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia. Real measurable improvement in people's lives that if you talked with those people, if you knew those people, you would actually be able to see what those improvements are. And I think that's a very important point that it's not just like some abstract index number that doesn't mean anything in the real world. It's actually based on things like people's quality of life, uh, people's level of education, how long they live. All those things are very, 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 in fact, I'd say those are the most important. The gap between the more and less developed countries has been coming down. It'll be interesting to see what this looks like after we get the post-pandemic numbers. So progress and development. There are eight development goals uh, from the United Nations, goal one. And this, I think we touched on when we were looking at population, the UNHDI, the sustainability goals, end poverty and hunger, cut substantially, but not in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, more children are going to school, except in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa is going to be, uh, although it's doing, it's improving. And as uh, Hans Rosling pointed out, Sub-Saharan Africa, compared to the speed of development of Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa is just blazing. They're doing great. But the place that they were starting from was really, really bad. So it's going to take them a while to catch up. Goal three, and promote, I'm sorry, promote gender equality, empower women. Gender disparities exist in all regions. That's not surprising. Child mortality and infant mortality has declined except sub-Saharan Africa. Number five, maternal, improve maternal health. Half a million women die annually from pregnancy complications. 99% of these women live in developing countries. Combat HIV, malaria, other diseases. The number of people living with HIV remains high, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Goal seven, ensure environmental sustainability. Yeah, I don't know. Water scarcity is a problem. Deforestation is a problem. Overfishing is a problem. Climate change is a problem. Uh, goal number eight, develop a global partnership. Uh, rather than increasing aid from developing countries, 
aid from developed countries has decreased. Uh, it's not good. It's a mixed bag. Everybody's doing better except sub-Saharan Africa. And the wealthy countries don't want to pay as much. So how do we measure standard of living? Let's look at the GDP and the gross national income. Some of the factors that create GDP, economic structure and worker productivity. Some of the problems, some of the issues surrounding GNI, inequality and concentration of wealth. And another issue is that the GDP is just the GDP. Uh, it's just a measure of economic activity. It, it doesn't mean it's good. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's just a measure of economic activity. However, it is interpreted as a good thing. If the GDP is up, that's great. Economically, that's fantastic. Uh, the economists are happy and they convince the rest of it that we should be happy. But, 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 but the GDP doesn't look at why that money is being generated, just that it is. So uh, the GDP measures, like I said, everything. The genuine progress indicator looks at economic activity and then subtracts money spent on things like environmental degradation, uh, losses due to climate change, uh, money spent on war, money spent as a result of violence. So if you factor out the bad money, maybe that, yeah, the GDP, it's just money. The genuine progress indicator is all the money minus the bad money, right? Like, uh, I think a, a really common example of how the GDP works to, to make things economically look good is, let's just say, hypothetically, I get divorced. If I get divorced um, and I'm going to need to find an apartment or a place to live, the GDP goes up. I got to buy new stuff. The GDP goes up. Uh, my wife and I hire lawyers. The GDP goes up. So there's nothing good about that situation necessarily, but the GDP goes up. If I total my car or my car gets in an accident, and I need to spend money to get it repaired, the GDP goes up. If I get robbed, the GDP goes up. If I have to replace all my stuff, there's economic activity, the GDP goes up. If there's a massive oil spill that results in the government having to spend millions of dollars to clean it up, the GDP goes up. So I would argue all of those are, are social costs. They are not social benefits. They are social costs, and they should be treated as such economically. So... Looking at that, the GDP, the GPI has pretty much been static while the GDP keeps going up. And that's a horrible diagram. Average weekly hours of paid work, uh, about 53, about 57 over a 30-year period. And uh, the percent of the global income going to the richest countries is continuing to increase. Increasing economic inequality is an aspect of GDP that isn't talked about. So the money, in fact, you can't, you probably won't be able to see this on the video, but this dot is actually high enough above the line that they don't need to do anything. And then they had to put a little tiny bar and a little smaller bar. And, it's, and you can't even see the bar for 2000. It's just the poorest 20% are making so little money, you can't even really see it on this graph. So I included... That, that was deliberate. Uh, let's see if we can do that again. I included a video on wealth equality in America. I will put a link to it in the playlist. Uh, I was going to show it and talk over it, but I did that on another video, and YouTube doesn't like it, apparently, when you try to talk over copyrighted videos. So inequality, the richest three people all are wealthier than the 48 poorest countries put together. So if you take the three richest people... Oh, and the wealth of the 225 richest, that number's wrong. It's now far fewer than that. As a result of the pandemic, that saw people like Jeff Bezos making billions and billions and billions of dollars. I think he's making $24,000 a second ballpark. Um, that, yeah, the GDP is going up, but that money is just going to the 1%. Executive pay is increasing at a rate far higher than workers' pay. Uh, the average CEO is now paid about 320 times as much as the typical worker in their industry. The average CEO is making about $21 million a year. The average worker making about $67,000 a year. And I would point out a lot of that employee's compensation probably comes in the form of stock. So there's a really, there's all kinds of 
crazy things that we do in this country that benefit the rich at the expense of everyone. And one of those is we tax investments. Like if you have money in stocks, that gets taxed differently than your paycheck. That's uh, the money on your paycheck is income tax. And you're probably paying about a quarter of your income to the federal government in the form of your income tax. Well, if you made an equal amount of money that was just profit on stocks that you own, that's going to get taxed at a capital gains tax rate of maybe 15%. So the incredibly wealthy pay less in tax than we do. In fact, there was just another one of those irritating videos that went around that was talking about most of the major corporations in the United States didn't pay a dime in taxes. If you paid any money to the federal government, you paid more than Amazon last year. If you paid any money to the federal government, you paid more than Exxon last year. Because they're the people that hire the attorneys to figure out how to get around the laws, the tax laws, but then they also, the attorneys that they hire also are sometimes the same people that write the tax laws. So the wealthy write the laws for themselves at the expense of the rest of us. And then this, the, the important part about this is that looking at the GDP, it doesn't tell you about the concentration of wealth in that country, about, about equal income in that country. Do the poorest people have enough to live on? And looking at the GDP, you just don't know. Oh, this is ecological footprint. So one of the things that ties into this is we're tied to the natural world, right? So I want to talk about this graph because it's great. The height of the bar is the hectares per person for that region, their global ecological footprint, or the North American ecological footprint is just under seven hectares per person, but the biocapacity available to the people are just under four. So way overshoot, same thing in Europe, way overshoot. The non-European Union countries, they actually have available biocapacity that they're not using. Same thing with Latin America, same thing Asia Pacific, that their biocapacity... Oh, so the height is the hectares per person. The width is the population. So like 4 billion people across Asia, it's wider, but because their uh, ecological footprint per person is lower, they get this they get this shape and we have this shape. It's just interesting because the, the ecological footprint or the, the, total, the total land being used is the shape that's the combination, the product really, because it's the multiplication of the height of the hectares per person times the number of people. So the area is actually the ecological footprint. That's again, a function of the per person times the people. And world biocapacity uh, is not keeping pace with the growth. Billions of global hectares that humans are using every year compared to the amount that the world has to offer. So again, looking just looking at the economics, economically things might be looking good, but there's real ecological ecological costs that don't get passed along in that. I thought this was interesting. If global wealth were distributed equally, the average person, so if we took all the wealth in the world, divided it by 7 billion and gave everybody a 7 billionth of the total global wealth, there, Canada, Western Europe, and Australia would be poor on average. Americans uh, would be less than two times as wealthy. So showing that wealth inequality in the United States is an issue, right? Uh, if you're, if wealth were distributed equally across the U.S., that, that shouldn't change. Uh, if the country's wealth were distributed equally, the average person would be six times wealthier in the United States. <laughs> in Russia, uh, seven times. In Ukraine, seven times. In Sweden, six times. That's fascinating. So globally, there's wealth inequality. Within countries, there's massive wealth inequality. I was going to say, and it's yeah, you can really see where the poorer countries are, an increase, 300-fold increase in wealth. So this is gross national income per capita. This is all the money that's made in a country divided by the number of people. Um, agricultural countries don't do as well as industrialized countries. This is adjusted for cost of living. 
And it's the same general pattern, North America, Western Europe, Oceania, on one hand, uh, South Asia, less developed, Africa, the least developed. GDP per capita, it's the same pattern. GNI per capita, the developed countries are doing better than the developing countries. And although it looks like 2009, the developing countries started doing better, the developed countries are still doing better than the developing countries. That gap doesn't look like it's necessarily coming down. One of the, one of the factors that contributes to uh, the GDP of a country is economic structure. This is this is review. Primary economic ac activities are extractive, secondary manufacturing. So I'm mining, I'm cutting down trees, I'm making the trees into lumber, and then somebody else is taking that lumber and making it into IKEA, and then IKEA is selling that stuff, and somebody is processing the data from all those transactions in the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary sectors of the economy. Your meat team. I found this on the internet and stole it. So we've got primary, I grow it. Secondary, I process it. Tertiary, I sell it. So that's the idea. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I stole that from the internet. I posted it to Facebook and a, a former student posted this to point out who those people are, except in the growing and processing, there's increasing integration, where the same company is then responsible for the production and the processing of that material, and then they sell it to somebody who sells it to consumers. The primary sector of the economy, we've got some old-timey coal miners and their lunches. I'm going to guess that this is the United Kingdom. Here we have another stolen photo uh, of... yeah. And this guy, this guy was actually selling prints on his website, but he's not the one that took it. So I'm not sure why he thinks he has copyright to this. Anyway, it's academic fair use. It's all cool. Uh, this is, again, primary economic activity. To cut down this tree, they had a 26-foot log, a 28-foot saw that was operated by hand. So the development of the chainsaw and steam power radically transformed logging across the United States because instead of actual human beings with a 28-foot-long pull saw, now they had things, they had motorized saws. So primary, primary industry, uh, the labor movement in the United States was put down by government troops, was put down by the National Guard. There are case after case after case of massacres of striking workers by government troops uh, and also by private detectives like the Pinkerton Agency, very very important in putting down labor movements in the United States in the 1800s, in the 1900s. So child labor, one of the things that we've done away with in this country. Uh, more child labor. These are our child coal miners showing what the conditions were like inside the mine. Here we have a New England. Uh, uh, this is a textile mill. You can see here's a, a, the belt. God. Yeah, the belt, the naked exposed belt that if you get your clothing, you're going to lose an arm. You could be killed as you get sucked into the machine. So these are small boys who are changing the bobbins on this uh, textile mill in New England. And now we've got the tertiary sector. So this would be primary. I'm just going to skip to tertiary with uh, the service economy, the service economy, the service economy. And we've got this share of labor force engaged in agriculture. Again, it's the same pattern, sub-Saharan Africa with economically undeveloped, underdeveloped. South Asia, underdeveloped. The more people are engaged in agriculture, the poorer your country is going to be. Agricultural land cover. So in the United States, we have a lot of agricultural land cover, same thing with Europe, same thing with India, but there's few people engaged in agriculture because of mechanization. Percent primary activity in the economy. Unfortunately, there's no data for much of, but you can see like uh, Cambodia, over 50% of their economy, of their economic activity is based on either ag, forestry, or fishing. I would like to see this redone 
to include the OPEC nations and, and Russia as well to see what percent of their economy is dependent on primary economic activity. I would like to see uh, ag, forestry, fishing, and fossil fuel extraction as well. So this is showing shifting sectors of the economy in more and less developed countries. The red is developed countries and the blue is developing countries. And in the developing countries, it looks, well, it only goes back to 1970. As I was going to say, there's a big drop in the primary economy in the more developed countries way before this happened. So well, the important things, uh, the increase in the secondary manufacturing in less developed countries. And I'm really surprised at the lack of, of uh, development in the tertiary economy and quaternary as well, especially with things like call centers and data centers overseas, because it's cheaper. You can get, you know, 10 people to do the job, the same job in less developed countries than you could pay one worker in a more developed country. So that's the reason behind the offshoring of jobs. United Kingdom, you can see the shift from secondary to tertiary activity. I would love to see a new map of this because what we're looking at is percent change in manufacturing employment. A couple countries increased, right? Spain, Spain increased, Ireland increased, uh, some of the former Yugoslavian states increased 1960 to 1990 in manufacturing, and I think that's probably a bad thing. The reason that manufacturing would be increasing is because those are areas that have low wages. So because they're less developed, the, the wages are cheaper. So yeah, if you could pay somebody in Italy or somebody in Bosnia or Croatia or Slovenia or Albania, y you would do that. The factory would move there. Uh, this is showing the the existence of raw materials across Africa and showing the importance of primary economic activities for some African countries, things like copper, uranium, chromium, iron, yeah, petrochemicals, oil and oil and gas in Nigeria, oil and gas across Egypt, Libya, and Algeria. So many of these African countries are almost completely dependent on exports of primary, exports of primary economic activity results for their economy. Like Mauritania, 99% of their economies is based on exports from things like iron ore. Niger, uranium, Sierra Leone, diamonds, phosphate, copper. Zambia, 99.7% of their total export earnings were from, exp were from primary commodities. 98% of that was copper. So their entire their entire economy of that country is dependent on not just copper exports, but the international copper market. If copper is discovered in another country and they can mine it more cheaply, Zambia is out of luck. Worker productivity refers to the amount of money, uh, the increase in value because of workers' labor. So if you are a country and your level of technology is such that you can make cargo ships, those are worth like twice as much as the same pile of metal. Cars, five times as much. Jet engines, 900 times. Communication satellite, 20,000 times as much. So a communication satellite costs 20,000 20, times the cost of the raw materials. So the higher tech your country is, or the more access to high tech your country has, the more, uh, the more money your country can produce. Productivity per hour worked. Uh, yeah, worker productivity has just been increasing, and yet workers' wages are stagnant because more money is flowing to the wealthy. So it's the same pattern, North America, Western Europe, Oceania. Uh, South America, lower wages. Russia and Asia, lower wages. $5, $10 an hour, 15 as opposed to 40 or $50 an hour. So productivity, yeah, just as it's just occurred to me, this is basically useless. We just looked at another map that showed the same thing, except this one has like nothing across Asia. But, you know, you can, you can see if you have a choice between are we going to set up our call center in France or Spain, or are we going to set up in Spain or Russia, you'd probably set it up in Russia. Uh, looking at other levels of economic activity, looking at other 
other aspects of the economy that would contribute to a healthier economy. I think this is interesting. Fixed telephone subscriptions per 100 people. These regions have more. Canada? Why does Canada have? Well, Europe has even more than we do. That's confusing. Uh, relatively, so per 100 people, 10. 0 to 10 phones per 10. Yeah, let me back up. <clears throat> Fewer than 10 landline phone subscriptions per 100 people. So one in 10 people has a landline. However, lots of cell phones. In fact, higher rates of cell phone use in other countries than the United States because the infrastructure isn't there. Across the developing countries, they just skipped the whole landline thing because it's easier to put up a cell tower and serve a city than it is to to either put up poles or dig trenches to bring lines to everybody's house. So I thought this, I, I'm really happy that I was able to find this map that's comparing cell phone use across some countries in Africa that are higher, uh, Ghana, for example, higher rates of cell phones, South Africa, much higher uses of cell phone use, uh, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, higher cell phone use than in the United States because we have landlines. And cell phones across Africa, this is from, uh, uh, I'm not sure how to even describe this. It was a Kickstarter campaign that's also a record label, music from Saharan cell phones. It's this guy who was spending time in the Sahara uh, listening to music played by uh, Tuaregs and other desert dwellers there and realized that the cell phone is how the music made it around, that it, the cell phones are being used to record to record musical performances, and then the music was getting transferred from cell phone to cell phone. So this, there's a couple, there's a couple albums that he's produced of these bootleg releases that just exist on cell phones in the Sahara. Population without internet access. Yeah, they've got cell phones, but they don't have a lot of internet access. Most of the people in those red countries don't have internet access. In fact, everybody in the orange or red countries, more than half the country doesn't have access to the internet, which then, the, as I keep saying, the more technologically advanced your country is, the better your, the stronger your economy is going to be. Share of population using the internet. Hey, it's the same map. Ah, the International Telegraph Network in 1900. Let's go back old school. So in 1900, that was the International Telegraph Network. So communicating between North America and Africa and South America and Europe and Asia and Australia. As of 1900, you could, you could theoretically get a telegraph from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world. By 2012, these are underseas internet cables, way more internet cables. Uh, that's it for economics. Let's talk about knowledge, education, literacy. I don't think there's going to be any surprises here. We're looking primarily at years of school. It's the same pattern. Um, and on the Our World and Data site, they also had some other data sets that were indicating the role of the, the education dividend, the benefits, the economic benefits of education. So countries that are less developed have fewer people in school. They have poor economic conditions. The countries that have more people in school typically have higher tech and better economic conditions, but you got to start someplace. So really starting with education across Africa would be a fantastic place to start. So we got average, average years of schooling, zero to two, uh, two to four, four to six, not a whole lot of school. And hopefully you remember uh, girls that go to even like four to six years of school have half as many children as girls that are not allowed to go to school across Africa. Expected years of schooling. Not sure why they have these two data sets, but I thought I'd include them both because I thought they were kind of interesting. School enrollment, places with higher female enrollment, places with higher male enrollment. Typical patterns, Pakistan, India, Chad, Mali, Burkina Faso, Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, Ethiopia, higher rates of males going to school, 
percent illiterate again the same pattern we keep seeing over and over and over again gender differences in literacy yes uh, substantial 20 percent difference in female literacy from males child mortality versus years of schooling so going from 1950 with a 20 child mortality in Portugal, going down to less than half a percent as education goes from zero from 1950 to 2010. So over 60 years, looks like a lot of countries with 10 to 20 percent infant mortality or child mortality, and then mean years of school. Uh, number three, long and healthy life. We're primarily looking at life expectancy. So we saw economic, and then we saw uh, standard of living things like education and knowledge. I'm sorry, education and knowledge. We, we saw standard of living, so that's the economic. And then we saw knowledge that was access to education. And now we're looking at long and healthy life. So that's things like life expectancy, infant mortality, natural increase rate, crude birth rate. So life expectancy, everything is related. Things that are closer are more related. So we've got... Um, North America, Western Europe, Oceania on one hand, Africa, South Asia on the other. Infant mortality, it's the reverse. There's life expectancy, infant mortality, child mortality, uh, children who die before their fifth birthday. Uh, looks like some of the higher values are, are I was going to say only 10 to 20, which is still shockingly high. 10 to 20% is, is shockingly high. Maternal mortality, uh, women that die in childbirth or pregnancy-related causes per 100,000 live births. I would like to take this opportunity to remind you that the United States is the only country that does not have uh, medical coverage for all its citizens of all the industrialized nations. So I think that's a big reason that instead of, instead of being to the zero to 10, we're in the 10 to 50 range with our maternal mortality compared to Western Europe, Oceania. Yeah. However, our 10 to 50 is, uh, well, 1,000 to 3,000 in, I think that's Sierra Leone. It's still 200 to 500 500 to 1,000, incredibly, incredibly high rates of maternal mortality. Caloric intake as a percent of requirements, places where people are getting enough food back in 2005. Same pattern, North America, Western Europe versus Sub-Saharan Africa. Persons per physician, I thought that was an interesting, a really interesting 10,000 and above, that means you're never seeing a doctor. I think that's what the... If you're rich and you live in the capital, you probably have a private physician. If you live in a village, you're probably never actually going to see a physician. I thought this was uh, totally fascinating. I'd like to thank ourworldindata.org. You should probably go check that website out because it's got more data than you can shake a big stick at. This is Burden of Disease. So this is years of life lost to premature death and years lived with a disability. Uh, one D-A-L-Y, one D -A -L -Y, disability adjusted life years. So the lighter, con lighter colors are better, equals one lost year of healthy life. So it looks like we're in the, I don't know, 20 to 30,000 maybe. It's got too many, too many divisions to be able to tell the difference without seeing everything at once. Like I think that's 10 to 20, so that's 20 to 30. So we're in the 20 to 30, which is then half the rate of like Afghanistan and much of much of Central Africa. Crude birth rate, uh, same pattern. Total fertility rate, yeah. Natural population growth, that's uh, the natural increase rate. Crude birth rate minus the crude death rate. Doubling times of 4 to 5%. Although that looks like it's probably just three to four. So three to four uh, with a 3% doubling, that's doubling every 24 years, every 36 years, every 36 years. Now that would be two, 24, 
3% would be doubling every 24 years. 4% uh, would be doubling, what, every 18 years? Mm. As opposed to 0 to 1% growth rate. And then we, the way we're looking at this in terms of regions, uh, I keep referring to this as North America. I would include, would I include Mexico? No, I wouldn't include Mexico. Anglo-America, that's pretty good. Latin America, I'm fine with that. South Pacific, I keep referring to that as Oceania. South Asia and Southeast Asia, I'm just kind of lumping together because demographically they're really similar. Middle East, another region. So we've got Western Europe, South Pacific, and Anglo-America, and the more developed, and then everybody else is someplace on the spectrum with Sub-Sahara, Sub-Saharan Africa, and then parts of South and Southeast Asia being on the bottom end. If you look at it from the North Pole, it looks like that. I don't know why you do that. Buxmister Filler developed this map projection. It's weird. Okay, talking about other aspects uh, that involve development, gender is an incredibly important factor with development. There's the gender index. We're going to look at health, female empowerment, female role in the labor force. The gender inequality index. Uh, the lower the number, the better. The higher number, the worse. And it's the same pattern. There's a clear connection between low scores on the gender inequality index and high population growth, high child mortality, low rates of literacy, low rates of school. It's all linked together. The change, the decrease in the gender inequality, Mexico, uh, many African nations doing quite well. Other countries not changing a lot, either because they were better to begin with, or they're just not changing, hard to say. Looking at health with regards to gender, looking at reproductive health, maternal mortality, adolescent fertility rate. Maternal mortality, we just looked at this. This is a different version of the same thing. Uh, so this is women that die per 100,000 live births, 500 below 30. I wish they had broken this out differently because often the U.S. shows up as an outlier compared to Canada and Western Europe. Adolescent fertility rate. So children being uh, adolescent fertility rate per 1,000 adolescents, 60 of them. So very high rates of adolescent fertility in the developing world. Looking at gender empowerment, we can look at things like seats held by women, women completing high school, life expectancy. We all know that women should live longer than men. If men are living longer, it's because women are being denied access to care. Gender empowerment measure, lots of no data, but North America, Western Europe, South Pacific, percent Professional and technical workers who are female, doing a good job there. Russia. Russia and Brazil doing a better job than the U.S. and Canada. That's totally interesting. Percent legislators that are female. 30%. Yeah, to get into the top tier, 30%, although more than half the world is women. 30%. Parliament seats held by women as a percent. And to get into the, the best category, 20%, which is just one in five. Lousy. Percent seats held by women below 10, 20 and above. Percent women. Yeah, we can't even make it into the... Ugh. Yeah, I think the Republicans in the last election elected more men named Gary than women. Uh... Places where women receive less education, it's the same pattern. The developed countries, women are doing the same things, if not more, than men. In the less developed countries, the women are not. They're not in the labor force. They're not getting educated. They're not working. They are being kept from success by patriarchy. Labor, uh, percent women holding full-time jobs outside the home. 80% in some of the better countries, 70, below 70 in the not as good. I would love to know how they got that data because everything that we just saw about Central Africa indicates that this shouldn't look this way. So I wonder when they say labor force, is that including at-home labor? 
the Millennium Development Goals. I think we looked at we looked at these earlier with regards to what kind of job we're doing with the Millennium Goals, and it seemed to be across the board everything was kind of better except Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, uh, development in general. Well, how do you develop? How do you get more developed? And this I'm going to go through kind of quickly because nobody's doing the self-sufficiency model. Everybody's doing the international trade model, despite the fact that uh, it's based on this guy's idea, which he just made up. So it's kind of funny. The Rosto model, the myth of developmentalism. So we start with a traditional society. Much of the economy is in ag or um, other primary activities. So you find, find something. Find something that you can sell. And then you enter the international market and you sell whatever you've got. Bananas, coffee, diamonds. Uh, and then you take the money from the profits from the primary sector. You invest that in the secondary sector. And then you take the profits from the secondary sector and you invest those in the tertiary sector. And so you bootstrap your way out of a traditional society with much of your economic activity happening in the primary sector. You got to get money from someplace, preconditions for takeoff, commercial exploitation of ag and extractive industry. So instead of people growing food for themselves, now you're going to have plantations growing nothing but pineapples or nothing but bananas or nothing but coffee trees or whatever. And then, you, so in order to do that, you got to get the money from someplace. If you had the money, you would be developing yourself, but you're not. So we'll talk about all these, all these issues. Here are the ideas. You start with a traditional society with lots of primary activity in your economy, primary economic activity. You take the profits from your primary activity. You develop a manufacturing sector. You then develop modern social, economic, and political institutions. And you develop a wider industrial and commercial base. And eventually you're... <laughs> the, the goal is high mass consumption, which all the environmentalists in the U.S. are saying, no, that's really not what we should be doing. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, some of the problems, it just, it, it's presented often as if it just works, but it, it doesn't. So the myth of developmentalism, it doesn't just happen. And you got to have either some sort of your, your climate, your soil, all those have to be aligned so that you can have some sort of primary economic activity. If you don't, there's no way for this model to work. And places are seen as interdependent. Places aren't really independent. They're part of, part of a global web. So international trade model, uh, often as winners, they talk about the OPEC states, except they're still in the primary sector of their economy. The Four Tigers, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, doing very well with the international trade model, although they kind of skipped much of that primary economic activity, so I don't think they're valid. And Japan, they also skipped. They invested in manufacturing post-World War II as a result of United States investment. So I don't think any of these countries are actually good examples of the international trade model where they have a primary economic activity that they take the profits and reinvest in manufacturing and then create a modern society out of it. Problems, uh, as I mentioned, uneven resource distribution. Like if you don't have a good climate for growing coffee or pineapples or bananas or timber or fishing or, or whatever, or you don't have vast reserves of iron ore or uranium or diamonds or whatever, you're out of luck. Another problem, the second problem is market stagnation that once you want to be part, I mean, the goal back here is that you're, you're linked to the international market, right? In fact, way back here, we're, we're selling on the international market. We're not trying to do things within our own country. We're trying to sell stuff to other people. Well, you got to have stuff to sell, which means that you got to have stuff and you have to have people that want to buy it. But often market stagnation if the economy tanks in other countries, that can affect your exports because nobody's going to buy whatever it is that you were selling because they just don't have the money anymore, which is also related to increased dependence on more developed countries. So what happens in a more developed country is going to affect, potentially affect your economy more than what's happening inside your country. 
Like if the American economy tanks and so nobody's buying computers, well, all those countries who depended on factories to manufacture computers, they're not going to be able to do that anymore. So we have countries investing in factories in production in other countries out of Western Europe, Japan, and the United States. The self-sufficiency model, nobody does it. India used to do it. North Korea kind of does it, but nobody, nobody really does the self-sufficiency model. The self-sufficiency model relates to autarky. Uh, the idea that instead of international trade, we're going to meet all of our goals internally. We're going to manufacture things for sale and use in our country. That's it. So instead of starting with one part of the economy, the primary sector and investing, we're going to have balanced investment. We're going to try to grow more slowly. And you got to separate your economy from the world economy by barriers, tariffs, taxes, quotas, all those things to keep your internal economy from being dominated by other countries' economies. Because chances are, whatever you're manufacturing in your country, there's a good chance that some other country can make it cheaper. And so people, given a choice, often usually buy the cheaper thing. So you got to keep those cheaper things out of your country so that they don't compete with domestically produced goods. We saw things like the, the Lada and the Trabant in the former Soviet Union, that there were crummy cars that you had to buy because you didn't have access to imported cars in the Soviet Union. Uh Problems of self-sufficient, let's see, well, it, it just doesn't exist anymore. These are these, So these would be alleged problems or past problems. Um, in the Soviet Union, the Lada was a copy. I can't believe I don't have a picture of a Lada. Go look one up. Um, there's no motivation to stay current, right? Like if you're in the United States, there's the Tesla and the Tesla, whatever, the Tesla 3, the Tesla X. They keep coming out with new ones. So given a choice, you're probably going to buy the new one. But part of Tesla's innovation is spurred by competition between other high-tech makers of cars. Well, if you're the only manufacturer of cars in the Soviet Union, you don't have to compete with anyone. So there's no motivation to improve or stay current. You might need governmental price supports. If, if, if that industry has an economy of scale that is unmet by your tiny country, you're going to need to, to economically support that activity so that you have access to whatever dish soap. I'll just make up something. You also need a bureaucracy to keep those. We don't want any imports, right? And so we're going to prevent imports. We're going to prevent exports. We're going to set up tariffs, which are taxes on imported goods that are paid by the consumer. Quotas, those are hard limits on imported goods. Licenses, yes, if you want to sell imported goods, you need a very expensive license. And all of these are designed to drive up the price of imported goods to the point that people don't buy it. Of course, that can create a black market, right? <laughs> the biggest problem, I don't have the money. I, I would totally develop my country if we had the, if we had the money, but we don't. We are a poor country, and we're a poor country, and so most of our economic activity is in the primary sector, so we just don't have any money. We don't have any spare money. That even if we wanted to ramp up production because we've got a climate that could produce bananas, we don't have a port, we don't have roads, we don't have infrastructure that would allow us to scale up our enterprises. So we're going to borrow money from the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. Um, and often the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund place demands on the countries that are getting these loans. And those demands are called structural adjustment programs. They are often very harsh. Uh, yeah, the two, many, the two major lenders, again, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. The World Bank says that half of its projects in Africa were economic failures. Projects fail to work because of engineering. Aid is stolen or spent on weapons. New infrastructure fails to attract investment. So what happens in these countries then is, and we'll see, that they take out loans to improve their economy. So those loans are taken out at the country level. So all the people in the country are on the hook to pay off that loan. And the country's hoping that the investment 
by getting those loans, they can invest in their economy, they can ramp up their economy to the point that their economy will produce so much more money that they can pay off the loans, but often that just never happens. And so the countries are stuck then in order to get the loan. Let me back up. Now, in order to get those loans, they had to take out... Yeah, let's cut that out. Uh, in order to take out the loan, they had to do these structural adjustment programs. So now their economy is hurting and they can't pay off the loan. And so often the World Bank or the IMF comes in and says, oh, well, you have to make other changes to your economy that are really going to hurt your economy, but will be good for the wealthy countries. So the aid itself often doesn't work, doesn't often doesn't help. These Structural Adjustment Programs, SAPs, they require, often require countries to privatize government services. They say, look, the reason your economy is so crummy is because you're having to pay the medical bills of the people in your country. Just stop that. The reason that you can't, that your economy is in the tank is because the government is administering the uh, natural gas pipelines and the government is also administering the water and the government's also the phone company. So if you sell that stuff off, you could actually make cash money off of taxes and then you could pay off your loans. Well, privatization is when public funds are used to support profits on public goods. This happened in Sacramento with the California American Water Company privatizing or being the company that is now running parts of the water system in Sacramento for profit. And how do you make a profit? You sell things for more money and you spend less making it. Well, how do you do that if you're the water district? Right, so public utilities aren't set up to make a profit. Public utilities are set up to serve the, pro the public good. It's not like the city in places that have public utilities like electricity, gas, water, sewage, those things, they're not set up to make a profit. It's not a business. It's set up to provide a public good from tax dollars. So the World Bank often comes in and says, look, 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 you could make bank off of your water system. So they, the government sells it, often at an incredibly cheap rate, to private companies that then sell that previously public good to people often for more money. The, and as I mentioned, how do you increase your profits? Well, you just don't, you don't spend money. So what do you do? You cut the wages to the workers who were public employees. Now they're private employees. Uh, you don't do maintenance. So you let things like gas lines degrade that results in the horrific gas, gas main explosion, uh, San Francisco a couple of years ago, PG&E. Uh, PG&E is well known for not doing maintenance on its electrical lines, which result in wildfires, and also not doing maintenance on its gas lines, which result in explosions. So that's how you keep your profits up. So privatization is when public funds are used to support a profit on public goods. They also may require countries to lift restrictions on imports, right? So I said with the self-sufficiency model, we're not going to import, we're not going to export, everything is just going to be internal. Well, if we want to develop, we're taking out a loan so that we can grow our banana industry, except that the World Bank would say, hey, I, I see what you're doing there. If you want to be part of the world economy, you got to be part of the world economy. So you have to allow imports of cheap goods from other countries. And you can't put price controls. Like when I lived in Paris, uh, the most you could charge for a baguette was 93 cents. The government said, yeah, loaf of bread, 93 cents. That's it. If you want to make fancy bread, you can charge more. But basic loaf of bread, 93 cents. Under these conditions, they would be told, no, you can't do that. People get to charge whatever they want for bread. They look at things and say, oh, yeah, public education, that's a waste of money. You got to cut that out. You should have for-profit educational institutions or you should just make everybody pay more. Uh, they often make countries cut government spending. I just mentioned that the effect of these are just generally disastrous for the humans that live in that country. Typically, we see price increases of three to four fold. The Maasai in Kenya were forced to become agriculturists rather than nomads due to a World Bank loan. The Amazon is being cleared with SAP funds. Slash and burn agriculture is being replaced with beef ranching so they can export cheap hamburger to the U.S. Uh, 
the loss of human life in the Amazon, the loss of irreplaceable biodiversity. Half of the species in the world live in rainforest, and those rainforests are being cleared uh, in Indonesia for palm oil. So orangutans are probably going to go extinct because we want a different fat in our food, and the Amazon uh, is showing signs of stress as a result of... Um, well, the water that falls in the Amazon got taken up by the trees. So when you cut down the trees, there's less water to cycle through the Amazon. So it gets drier. So you have fewer trees. So it gets drier. So you have fewer trees. So all of that is being funded with these so-called development loans. Algeria, 200 killed in riots as a result of SAPs. Benin, university teachers' pay was cut 50%. That wasteful government spending. Jordan, Bread prices tripled as a result of the removal of price supports. Nigeria riots after the government shuts down university programs. India, the World Bank supported energy privatization. So instead of the government supplying your electricity, instead of you buying it from the government, uh, it was purchased by an American company so that they could make profits. Uh, after a huge storm, the company demanded $60 million for repair or they were going to triple the prices of electricity to all of their customers. Very typical of what happens. The prices go up, the quality goes down. Mexico, the telephone system in Mexico was sold to Carlos Slim. The rates went from 16 pesos a minute to 100 and 115 pesos per minute. And I wrote this, I wrote customers lost $33 billion due to the sale. So that the customers didn't lose $33 million. The customers had to pay an additional $33 billion for their phone service, which, if you've been paying attention, and hopefully you are, that means the GDP went up by $33 billion. So to an economist, and this also goes back to my question in the lessons from Ladakh about why would a government economist say, well, somebody making a few dollars a day is better for the economy than these subsistence villagers living, <laughs> living uh, meaningful lives and enjoying a feeling of connectedness with their neighbors and with their environment. All of that's been lost. They're working a crappy job in the city, but the GDP went up. Telmex got sold. Instead of paying 16 pesos a minute, people paid 115 pesos a minute. The GDP went up. Also, at the same time, they had to cut healthcare spending, cut that wasteful government spending. That wasteful government spending was keeping people alive with the result that the infant mortality rate tripled because they had to cut their healthcare spending. Indonesia, similar. They had to cut health spending with diarrhea and anti-diarrhea medicines, contraceptives, and antibiotics becoming too expensive. Zambia, same deal. You, you want a loan? Fine. You just got to stop spending money on healthcare. So under five mortality hit 202 per thousand. The life expectancy dropped to 40. Uh, the World Bank and the IMF had sponsored huge dam projects, which ecologically are often disastrous. And a couple decades ago, it says now, this is a couple decades ago, the big trend was water privatization. This is still a trend. In fact, just last year, the head of Nestle said that water was not a human right. Nobody has a right to drink water. If you want water, pay me. So across the world, water systems that were paid for by the government have been replaced. Well, the systems are still there. It's just who's operating it is now Sué Lyonnais des Yeux or Vivendi or Bechtel, these for-profit corporations. So how do you make more money? Well, you increase the cost, the fees, and you decrease the quality. So France, the rates were increased by 150%. Five million people received water tainted with bacteria. In the United Kingdom, as a result of water privatization, there was a 450% increase in fees. The CEOs and the profits went up seven times, uh, and 1.7 times more people got their water turned off because they couldn't afford their water. So I'm sure the head of Nestle was very happy, but for those people that got their water disconnected because they couldn't pay the increase in fees as the result of privatization, that's horrifying. Casablanca, Philippines, Ontario, Canada, again, 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 same exact increase in fees and contaminated water. Argentina, South Africa, Ghana. In Ghana, uh, one study estimated that 50% of income was being spent on water by some of the poor. 
In Bolivia, the American corporation Bechtel purchased the water system. They jacked the rates up 50 to 100%. There were riots. The military was called out. There were incidents of the military shooting civilians. The result of that was that Bechtel was given the contract to upgrade the water supply to San Francisco in the United States. Uh, Zambia, I wanted to talk about Zambia again. Uh, and we've mentioned two, two aspects of this, that Zambia had to cut healthcare spending because of SAPs, the structural adjustment programs. Well, Zambia wanted to build a railroad to the coast to market their copper. So they're this is an, a, a perfect example of Rosto's model that here's your extractive industry. They got loans to bootstrap their extractive industry. We're going to make money off of selling copper, except the world copper market tanked. So they ended up not actually exporting copper, but they still took out those loans. So now they took out loans that resulted in order to take out the loan, just to be able to take out the loan. They had to cut healthcare spending, and now that they've got the loan that they still have to pay off, they don't have the income that was going to make that loan payoff possible. World Bank loans, uh, globally, lots of money being given out by the World Bank, which means that in all these in all these places, they're being subjected to structural adjustment programs. The value of debt to gross national income in some places, 60%. So for, uh, so that's Zimbabwe, that's Zambia. I think that's Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe, value of debt to GNI, over 60%. So looking at their income, if their income was $100,000 a year, their debt is over $60,000. So these countries, there's like no way that they'll be able to pay off these loans. Estimated debt as a percentage of GDP. This, unfortunately, only goes up to 25% and above, but it should be the same, same pattern, although this is newer. Debt crisis in 2012. We see uh, European and Asian countries having problems with debt, where greater than 30% of their debt service as a percent of exports of goods and services. So 20 to 30% of their the money that these countries are making from exports, they're having to pay off the debt with. Ah, globalization. So this is the historic roots of the World Trade Organization. Um, Post-World War II, the richest countries got together and said, how can, we make, how can we make more money? And what they came up with was, well, if we get rid of tariffs, that would be great. So GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, post-World War II, there was an agreement. They were getting rid of tariffs, those taxes on imported goods. 1986, they became known as the Multinational Trade Organization. And they said, well, we did some good work with these tariffs. But let's, let's continue that work and remove non-tariff barriers to trade. So they got rid of the, most of the tariffs, and the non-tariff barriers to trade were things like environmental safety and labor rules. And many advocates of, uh, of sustainable development say that the MTO created a race to the bottom. Because the way you get ahead is to have the fewest barriers to trade. And remember, what's considered a barrier to trade now would be paying a decent wage, having environmental, labor, or safety rules that would uh, increase the amount of money that a company would have to spend to do business. Or they just wouldn't be able to make as much. If, if you don't have to clean up your pollution, you're going to be a lot more profitable than the corporation that's actually having to pay for the cost of their pollution. So in the United States, what happened a lot with the multinational trade organization was companies say, we can't do these things and stay competitive. So if you make us pay a decent wage, a living wage, if you make us pay full taxes, if you make us limit pollution, we will just move someplace else. And that's exactly what they did. This is the big, so we see the beginnings of the offshoring of factories from developed countries to less developed countries 
because those less developed countries pay lower wages, they don't have labor rules. In fact, in many of those countries, the corporations work hand in hand with the government to murder and terrorize labor and environmental activists. Uh, every now and then in my Twitter feed, I'll see the, the report of the death, the murder of another environmental activist, often in the Amazon. So companies say, you can't make us pay a decent wage. You can't make us pay full taxes. Like when companies move the Amazon, Amazon, great example, they were looking for things like exemptions and property tax, exemptions to other taxes that would give them an economic competitive advantage to move there. So 50 years ago in Massachusetts, in fact, I found a, a picture uh, when I was looking for the child labor pictures, I thought I'd grabbed a picture of uh, two young girls in Yazoo, Mississippi. So in Massachusetts, there was, in the northeastern United States, there was a strong labor tradition of unionization where the workers were working together to make sure that they were paid a decent wage, to make sure that their working conditions were safe. And the South hasn't had that. So 50 years ago, or 60 years ago, there was a flight of the textile industry from the Northeast where they had been because of those mills on the rivers along the fall line. Well, they left the Northeast and fled to the US South because there were people out of work and they didn't have a labor tradition. So in California, post NAFTA, there was a flight of businesses from California to Mexico. Uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal interviewing auto CEOs said 40% of them were going to move to Mexico. Another 25% said, said that they weren't going to move to Mexico. They weren't planning on it, but that they were going to tell the union that they were if the union didn't go along with their demands for lower wages. In 1995, the MTO became known as the World Trade Organization. And that's when they really, really got serious about eliminating all of the non-tariff barriers to trade. So these th public safety laws, they, there are things that make that to a rational person like make absolutely no sense. How could a labor law be a barrier to trade? Well, if in my country we're telling people that they can only work eight hours a day and this other country, they don't have a limit so I can make people work longer hours, which is more profitable, that's a barrier to trade. Um, rules on product standards, investment policy. I'll give you examples of, of all of these, of how these are non-tariff barriers to trade. And the World Trade Organization rules limit what laws countries create and maintain. There's an interesting nexus of people who are very concerned about this, labor activists, environmental activists, fair trade activists on one hand. And on the other hand, you have people uh, on the far right who are very concerned about national sovereignty that WTO rules limit what laws countries can create or maintain. The WTO itself is completely undemocratic. There's 134 member nations, 33 non-voting observer nations. The decisions are supposed to be made by unanimous agreement, but it's usually decided by the Quad, who meets in secret, and then those decisions are announced to the other countries who have no political or economic power to challenge the United States, Canada, Japan, and the EU. Non-democratic, the decisions are made in secret, the discussion content's never published, their hearings are by invite only. A country, so the actions are taken, companies sue countries, and the country is presumed to be guilty until they prove that they're innocent. There are no conflict of interest laws because it's the richest people in the world making laws that benefit the richest people in the world. And as I said, WTO rules take precedence over the laws of a country. Every single public health or environmental law has been ruled that has been challenged in the WTO has been ruled illegal. The standards are set by the industry. So for food, there's this creepy ass book, the Codex Alimentarius. Uh, it, just the name is creepy. I've never actually read it. The Codex Alimentarius is a book that sets out what food safety requirements, what the food standards are for the WTO. So as long as the standards meet the standards, as long as the standards in the production and the food meet the standards of the Codex Elementarius, there's nothing a country can do to block it. Again, the official position of the U.S., the official position of the U.S., this is going back to the Clinton administration. It's not, this isn't new. The official U.S. position is that laws must be changed 
U.S. laws, federal, state, local, need to be changed if they conflict with the WTO policies. And they also eliminate the precautionary principle, which is a very important idea that something new is presumed to be dangerous until it's proved to be safe. So a new chemical, a new whatever, the precautionary principle says, until you do enough studies that show it's safe, you can't sell that. Well, the WTO says, hey, we think it's safe. Nobody's shown it's harmful. Although it's not really clear since the meetings are held in secret, they're by invitation only, that companies are suing countries. Where do the environmental and labor activists get to come in and say, hey, this, this chemical is toxic or these labor conditions are illegal? There's no space for outside groups to come in to challenge any of this, which is exactly it, that's, that's deliberate. It's by design. Countries can't block imports due to labor conditions, human rights abuses, environmental effects. Those are all non-tariff barriers to trade, including restrictions on food with toxic chemicals. So if you want to use pesticides that are illegal in your country, but allowed by the Codex Alimentarius, you'd be able to sue your country and win because that's a non-tariff barrier to trade. If I can use these chemicals, if the Codex Elementarius says I can use these chemicals, then I can use these chemicals. And if you're making me use something that's more expensive, that's a non-tariff barrier to trade. Uh, labor conditions. This was very important in the movement, the divestment and boycott movement against the racist apartheid regime in South Africa would be illegal. Uh, many countries decided to not do business. Countries and schools around the United States stopped doing business with South African corporations because of their apartheid regime. Well, now those companies could sue the United States and say, hey, there's nothing wrong with a puzzle. You don't like the government of my country. That's tough. There's nothing wrong with this puzzle. You can't block the importation of this puzzle. Uh, slave labor used in China. For example, we learned about the use of slave labor among the Uyghurs, the Uyghur, the Muslim people in China. We couldn't block the importation of products that were created by slave, literal slave labor because there's nothing wrong with a the product. They would say, yeah, I, I get that you don't like that we made this with slaves. However, there's nothing wrong with a product. You can't block the importation just because it was made with slaves. That's a non-tariff barrier to trade. And safety environmental programs have to be the least costly alternative. Um, examples, things that have been challenged, uh, U.S. recycling programs, right? If you take your aluminum cans to the recycling place, you get money for it. That is a non-tariff barrier to trade for foreign aluminum companies. The U.S. government is artificially helping the American aluminum industry by creating this recycling program bans on asbestos and carcinogenic food additives, gas guzzler taxes. They say, hey, you can't, you can't say that the car has to meet a certain mile per gallon. Dolphin protection laws, dolphin safe tuna. There's some very simple modifications that you can make to the nets to let, for example, sea turtles go free. Um, and if you're catching dolphins along with the tuna, but you're not actually selling the dolphins, you can't block the importation of that tuna just because it's killing dolphins. Canada had a reforesting program. So lumber companies come in, they chop down the trees, the Canadian government was replanting. Other companies sued and Canada was told, you can't help the Canadian forestry corporations, your own domestic industries, unless you want to help everybody. So by the Canadian government reforesting, providing more raw material for the company to cut down later, that's helping the Canadian industry, which isn't fair to all the non-Canadian industries. Whaling restrictions, Danish recycling laws, drift net fishing, just because you're causing species to go extinct, you're not selling the extinct species, so we don't care. Venezuela challenged the Clean Air Act requirement that refineries produce cleaner gasoline. The WTO ruled that the U.S. was wrong. Venezuela had the right to export dirty gas and the U.S. had to buy it. Again, companies have more power than countries now. Puerto Rico, back in 1991, set higher milk standards. Canada couldn't meet that standard and sued. The case was heard by three Canadian and two, two U.S. judges, no Puerto Rican judges. And they said, well, yeah, According to the standards of the Codex Elementarius, this Canadian milk is fine. So Puerto Rico, you either have to allow the importation of what you think is bad milk, or you'll be subject to economic sanctions. That's the, 
That's the stick. The stick is that the WTO gets to enforce their own rules. The EU refused to import U.S. beef due to the use of hormones. The World Trade Organization said the EU had to import U.S. beef since it met the standards of the Codex Alimentarius. Textiles. Here we go. Let's let's bring this back to textiles and look at Malaysia, and they should have won, right? GATT required the U.S. to remove barriers to importing cheap Malaysian textiles, which is great. So the Malaysian textile industry is going to do really well, except that same GATT said to Malaysia, uh, you can't block foreign investment in your Malaysian factories. So what happened was... Malaysian factories got purchased by foreign companies, realizing that there was an economic opportunity there. And then they told the workers they had to work harder and take pay cuts in order to pay off the loans. In the U.S., the workers were told exactly the same thing that the Malaysian workers were told. Hey, you got to take a pay cut and work longer because otherwise we can't compete with these cheap imported Malaysian textiles. So the companies win, but all of the workers and the customers lose. Another example, four Asian nations sued the U.S. over shrimp imports that were caught using nets that kill sea turtles. The U.S. Endangered Species Act said some things about uh, nets and turtles. There's some simple modifications you can make, like I said, that allow the turtles to just swim out of the net. They didn't want to do that. They said, look, there's something wrong with a shrimp. We're not selling you turtle. We're selling you shrimp. The fact that we're killing turtles has nothing to do with a shrimp. So you need to buy our shrimp. And that's what the WTO said. So some of the effects, uh, Mexico, companies, companies, polluting companies, especially moved from the United States to Mexico. Uh, the pollution there is largely uncontrolled, has been largely uncontrolled because of lax government oversight, corruption, bribes. Um, so record numbers of babies being born without brains in Mexico and Matamoros. U.S. companies moved to Mexico. A random sample of 12 factories, none of them were in compliance with Mexican laws. 95% of the companies surveyed operating in Mexico after they moved there couldn't account for their toxic waste. I don't know. I don't think we had any. And then the location of uh, employees in these factories in Mexico after the American companies moved there. On the other hand, there's fair trade. I made you watch some videos about from Patagonia on fair trade. I think I'm going to make up an assignment, something super brief to talk about, like, what is fair trade? So it's a set of business practices designed to advance a social, economic, and environmental goals. These include... It, Eliminating the intermediaries, so it's direct from the producer to the consumer. Distributing pros profits and risks more fairly, so better wages for the workers. Profit sharing, worker-controlled collectives, very common in fair trade. Increasing management skills, promoting safe and sustainable farming methods. So it's a fair trade. There's a couple organizations that certify fair trade. So they'd come to the factory, they'd come to the farm, they would make sure that that, they, the, that their standards are being met, and then they get certified as a fair trade producer. Uh, Small-scale farmers and artisans join democratically managed cooperatives. Some of the advantages, they can qualify for credit to buy equipment. Uh, these cooperatives can purchase materials at a lower cost. Small-scale farmers make cooperatives producers democratically manage resources. So instead of one person owning the land and the factory and controlling everything, now the workers are controlling the means of production. Profits are reinvested in the community instead of going to stockholders. So like Nestle, if they're making cocoa, the workers are going to be paid a low wage. They're probably going to have dangerous working conditions and the profits don't go to the workers. The profits are going to go to the people who own stock in Nestle worldwide. Well, now the profits go back to the workers, go back to the community. So the workers have to be paid fair wages, at least enough to cover their basic needs. They are permitted to organize a union and have the right to collective bargaining protected by environmental and safety standards. Uh, there's really not a lot of downsides to fair trade for the workers and for the consumers. For their competitors with the multinational corporations, there's a problem. 
Fair trade in the U.S. seems to be mainly craft products. Uh, I think in Europe, it's much more common for it to be food. Yeah, coffee, tea, bananas, chocolate, cocoa, juice. Most fair trade sales are in food in the U.S., primarily craft products. Uh, fair trade products don't necessarily cost more because the same, the same money is being spent. It's just that the profits are going to the workers, not stockholders in the corporation. Oh, uh, yeah, this was just some random stuff. Uh, and it's important to provide a historic context. Uh, your experiences are your experiences, uh, which, which are important. And looking at the historic context, there's often important stuff like consumption. Humans have consumed as much since 1955, after 1955, as everybody else before 1955 combined. Uh, half the CO2 that we've put into the atmosphere has happened since the show Seinfeld first started. So the increase in pollution, the increase in consumption, the increase in population, all of these are very, very recent. In fact, that 1950 is a really good point. If you remember from the population growth chart, that was like the inflection point where we sh really shifted gears again and the, the natural increase rate took off. Most of the consumption is being done by the wealthy. A child born in a more developed country will consume and pollute 30 to 50 times more than a child born in a less developed country. So really, uh, I was going to say, really the problem is people like me, wealthier people in more developed countries. Consumption, there's a billion, over a billion people living on a dollar a day. Half the world exists on $2 a day. Over a billion people don't have clean water. 2.4 billion people don't have adequate sanitation. So that's like toilets and sewage. Probably probably a billion people hungry worldwide. Oh, and that's the last slide. That's kind of a bummer to end on. Uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the chapter. I hope you find it interesting. I hope I hope you're beginning to see, because even just doing this lecture slide video, I realized how much of the topics, how much of the ideas in this chapter tie back to things we talked about in the first chapter or the population chapter that really in geography, I think geography as a discipline is, is best when you realize just how connected everything is.